is 5 p.m. Uh, so on the East Coast or wherever it may be. So that officially means we're starting our first ever um, um, version of Keylogger Engagements. So I'm James and Kyle and Kevin. And then, of course, we're very honored to have Dr. Rob Johnson with us. And I'll do his biography in a second. So just a quick overview and kind of the ground rules as we get in here is uh, we're going to do... Uh, some first off, something we call the pregame, which is 20 minutes of some light fare. So first off, keylogger engagement is an idea to have discussions with top academic thinkers in strategy, warfare, academic side of the house, as well as policy as well. You'll see with our next guest, we're going more to the policy side. Um, in the light area, we're going to have some banter. We're going to have some drinks. We're going to have some Q&A. So it's to have it a little bit different from your standard, uh, very, you know, uptight and uh, regimented book talk, book discussion. And this is more of a fun atmosphere and also involve the uh, audience as well. So we'll do 20 minutes, what we call the pregame, uh, which is just some fun questions that every single person will get uh, as they come on the show to kind of loosen the atmosphere and enjoy our drinks. Um, then we're going to go into the 35-minute uh, discussion or give or take, and these are all flexible as we're having a good time on the book itself. Uh, and then we'll take a five-minute break. Uh, now, during that five-minute break, you guys have the Q&A function on the Zoom. Please ask us questions. Uh, we will find uh, about four to five, depending on time, maybe six questions after the break, which then we will turn your mics on and your videos on, and you can ask uh, Dr. Johnson directly the question, and they actually have some chance to ask it. And then we'll close it down and talk about our next episode. So that's kind of the the, fun, the way it's going to flow. We hope everybody's out there and staying safe in these uh, you know these times, as well as enjoying a drink because I think it's Friday night and it's five o'clock here, so therefore it's five o'clock somewhere as uh, Buffett would say, the, the great poet of the South, Jimmy Buffett, would definitely say. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Robert Johnson, Rob Johnson from the direct, he's the director of Oxford Changing Character of War Center. Uh, he's a fellow at the Pembroke College and the association at the Department of Politics at International Relations at the University of Oxford. He's a historian uh, and he combines academic analysis with knowledge exchange and policy. He's authored multiple books, uh, multiple articles, and he is currently working, uh, he just currently published the most recent book, which is Lawrence of Arabia on War which we'll be discussing. So, uh, and to let everybody know is we have a couple copies of that, four to be exact. So um, the four best questions, which will be kind of upvoted, as you can see, you can upvote questions. We'll definitely, not only you can ask the doctor the question, but most importantly, you can have a chance to win a free book. Uh, so that's kind of a good thing. So, you know, free books are great. So uh, I think that's a very important thing. So once again, this is sponsored by the Civil Affairs Association. And as well as uh, our, our, our sponsors as well, which we'll talk about later after the break. But once again, this is all part of the CAA and part of our ongoing um, efforts to become more uh, engaged and more engaging academic side of the house. So, uh, Kyle, Kevin, do you have anything to add? Because I have a tendency to run my mouth. No, let's just get it started. <clears throat> okay. So, with that being said, Dr. Johnson, welcome to the pregame. We are going to ask you a, a, series, a series of seven questions. The points don't matter. The answers are made up and the points don't matter. To quote okay, the famous British television show, that we ripped, yeah. with, with, which we ripped off here in the States. And um, right. first off, what is your name? <laughs> well, you know, um, I'm going to answer that question by saying, um, yes, of course, officially, uh, it's Rob Johnson. You know, the kind of big fashion these days is to have a... Uh, Preferred pronoun, right? So my preferred pronoun is Lord of the Universe. Um, and I think it's very important that, um, you know, we, we respect all those people who've got sort of um, issues about, you know, what their identity is. So uh, my, my preference is, yeah, is to be known as, uh, as uh, Lord of the Universe. Um, and as you know, the British, you know, we're very keen on our lordships and, uh, you know, our status. Uh, so I guess that's what I call myself. I would have thought that one was already taken, Rob. Uh, well, you know, the, um, I know Skeletor uh, is a sort of figure who's, who's clearly claimed that. So Emperor Ming, of course, you know, Adolf Hitler. Uh, there are a few, there are a few <laughs> characters who've tried. Um, but um, no, I think I've got a pretty good chance this time. You know, um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's probably my aspiration. But it's quite funny. When you put it at the bottom of your emails and say preferred pronoun, uh, what you prefer to be called, it, it is quite interesting the reactions you get. Um, it's, it's quite good. Fair enough. I think we lost Cheech. Uh, Rob, could you uh, 
lean closer to the microphone. We're getting some comments that people can't yeah. read uh, out there in the uh, okay. in the ether. Okay. Um, is that better? Yes, it is for right. me. All right, I'll try that. Sorry, dropped off there. Are we still on the first question? Moving on to second, brother. Okay. Yep. okay. <laughs> Rob, what yes. is your quest? My quest? Um, wow, that's a really good question. Um, you know, the funny thing is, uh, I, suppose, I suppose it's about um, this, uh, this kind of whole idea about professional military education. Um, you know, uh, I, I guess it, it, most of the audience is made up of people who have um, been through um, some kind of military service. Uh, one of the things that kind of really uh, strikes you is that um, people uh, that really frustrate you the most are not your immediate comrades, you kind of know what the drills are, uh, but there's kind of knuckleheads who don't really seem to understand uh, that they need to learn something and adapt quickly to the situation they're in. So um, although I'm no longer in the armed forces, I left a long time ago, um, one of the things that really, really drives me is this idea that you can somehow make use of the past uh, make use of history, make use of um, ideas from other people. And then I think my quest is to sort of make sure that we kind of package that in the right form, and then we get that to people so that they can adapt quickly when they're kind of under pressure and learn how to decide things. So, I guess that's what on, really. How successful has your quest been? Because I know that it's a sidetrack on it, but you know, as, as someone that's about to start ILE, which is the, you know, the, the big PME for us on this end and uh, how successful has it been on breaking through some of your integrative ideas into usually what is seen as a historic uh, methodology or very much focused on history, which is important and history is very much predicated on operations as we learned through the book, but how successful has it been to put some of these different forward thinking ideas to uh, either the British and I see you've worked a lot with the Americans as well. How successful has that quest been so far, would you say? Uh I'm going to think about this very, very carefully, and I'm going to say I'm a total and unmitigated failure. No, <laughs> um, so, I mean, seriously, I, I, uh, it, it's a work in progress. Um, there are some people you can reach, right? There are some enlightened people who just say, OK, I get that. I understand, the, I understand what we're trying to achieve here. And they'll adapt, and they want to learn. Uh, and there are just a few people in the system who um, don't want to change at all, um, or who are remarkably inconsistent. Okay, so, uh, how, would I, how would I measure how we're doing? That's, that's really difficult. Um, you can only measure things as my outcomes, right? Uh, so I'd say probably making some progress. I'm on my, on my desk at the moment, which I'm not allowed to show you. Um, there is a, a, a kind of war course we run here um, in the UK. Um, it's a higher command and staff course. Um, and I engage with the, kind of the director of that course. And he and I are currently shaping the curriculum. So you know, kind of, kind of hope it sort of works with people at that level. And I've done some work with the uh, what we call the Royal College of Defence Studies, um, which does sort of stuff at the strategic level. Um, but the kind of the, the difficulty is that we look back to kind of events we've been in over the last you know, kind of maybe ten years or so, and if we were really really honest with ourselves, I think we'd say actually we haven't been that adaptive. We're very keen to keep going where we're going, and then we kind of turn around and go, why isn't this work? Okay, let's throw more resources at it. But my, I'm an advocate of saying stop throwing resources at it, and start thinking about. It. That's definitely a hard paradigm to think to get over. And I think we'll discuss this more uh, on it because like this is a really important part. And I feel like a lot of this book really, and I think you guys might agree, kind of leans towards that. Uh, it's definitely echoed, or at least that sentiment is put forward in some of the, the, the thoughts of Lawrence that you definitely translate very well throughout the book. So question three, and this is probably the hardest question of them all. What is your favorite color? And I spelt that C-O-L-O-U-R for you. Thank you for saying Kalora. Uh, my Kalora uh, is, um, that's a really good one actually, because, um, you know, I, was, I wasn't sure what I'd answer. I mean, the kind of the, um, the standard answer for anyone who's been in the army is to say green, um, because, you know, uh, that's really the only language we can actually talk in. Um, I mean, like dressing up as trees, you know, and hiding in ditches, uh, which would be trenches and things like that. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a sort of old-fashioned person, as you can tell from my, my glorious uh, whiskers. Um, so I'm going to give you two answers. One is uh, the sort of green and gold, which was my old regimental colours, the old Devon Show and Dorset Regiment. Um, they had a, we had a little tie, you know, it was kind of green and gold in colour. Um, so I'm loyal to that, because, you know, my regimental motto uh, was Semper Fidelis, which I know the US Marine Corps is involved in, which is kind of nice. 
think my ultimate favourite colour has got to be red, right? As in red coats, because um, we were the sort of guys that, for a few years anyway, at least, uh, managed to sort of control the United States um, as a colony until we got our butts kicked and we got kicked out. Um, but I've, I've always been a fan of that sort of film Zulu, uh, and that chap with the red coat um, who had whiskers like these. So um, I'd say that's probably my favourite colour. That's why I, I think I'm looking at it anyway. Do, do you feel more important with that hat on, Rob? Oh, God, yeah. Um, we should that's do the point. a huge hat collection. Um, I've got a sort of general's hat with feathers on it. And uh, the thing I've not got yet is a sort of medieval helmet. That would be kind of good, you know, with all the sort of paraphernalia on top. That would be great. So, yeah. Well, Michael Caine likes that hat. He, he, he certainly he's, does. He certainly does. But yeah. so those are all great answers, but they're all incorrect. Um, as okay. you're well aware, the Civil Affairs Regimental color is purple. So I'm just going to put down purple as your okay. answer and then give you plus 100 points on that. <laughs> that's, that's my coin, so I'm, okay. I'm not going to let you know. Okay. So yes, purple. Purple it is. So um, right. on to question four in the pregame here. And, um, and okay. I, I just want to, before I stop, I, I completely forgot to say it. So not only is the CAA running this, it is, uh, I, I need to make sure that we recognize Civil Solutions International specifically for making this happen. Uh, they are, they're, your free books are part of the leap uh, to do that. They are a great partner and I highly recommend everybody go check out their site and go visit their website, page, Facebook and anything along those lines. So my, my dearest apologies for not mentioning that up front. So question four, uh, right. what is your favorite bar in the world? Ah. Ah, no, that's, that's easy, okay? Well, because there's, I mean, there's a lot of choices, but there is a sort of favorite one. And um, in Oxford, um, there is an old pub uh, called The Bear. Um, and it's called, you know, Bear um, claims to be the oldest pub uh, in Oxford. The real problem is, of course, with the claim like that, as an, you know, an old medieval city uh, like Oxford, is that pretty much everybody thinks their pub is the oldest one. So when you walk around the city as a tourist, you'll find, you know, sign up saying, this is the oldest pub in Oxford. But the reason why we love it so much is because it's absolutely tiny. Um, you can fit probably no more than about 30 people in it uh, on a good day, uh, and probably 20 if you've got some fairly portly, uh, corpulent uh, individuals. Um, but the nice thing about the pub is that we call it our unofficial common room uh, at, uh, at Oxford in, in Pembroke College. Um, and what's remarkable is if you walk in with a tie on, uh, in the old days, uh, they would simply grab you by the tie and they'd cut it off and they put a piece of the tie on the wall or the ceiling. So the entire building uh, is full of ties or parts of ties, all with labels on about who they belong to, uh, including, you know, old English regiments and um, you know, uh, ships, um, clubs, rowing clubs, fencing clubs, you name it, all of these in there. It's a fantastic collection, but it is it's one of the quaintest and oldest pubs. And any of you guys want to come over to Oxford and uh, come see me, um, I will take you to the bear for that, that sounds fantastic. And I, I, I like the uh, everybody's claim to be the first, the oldest bar, because I think the three of us and many people here have met many CA team leaders who are the first team leader in Syria. They all seem to have that claim over and oh, over yeah. and over again. <laughs> I think it resonates well with both our audience. So, all right. That, <laughs> no, that was a good point. Much, no deductions on that, on that one. That's a fantastic answer. So now going on the drinking theme, what is in that mug tonight for you, good sir? What are, what are we, what Ooh. libations are we indulging on? This um, evening. Here's the bottle. Right, so this, um, if you can see that, is Old Speckled Hen. Um, now, Old Speckled Hen uh, is, uh, is, is very clever in the sense because uh, it's play on words. Um, it's not just the idea of fine beer or even an animal which you find in the countryside in England. Um, it's actually um, was a sort of colour uh, that was um, you know, used to adorn early cars and things like that. So, uh, this um, is a very traditional old English ale. It's not really lager, sorry, uh, but it is old ale. You drink it at room temperature, which is, I know, something kind of anathema to my buddies in the United States, but that's what they do. Um, it has a very fine flavour, um, and um, I'm particularly fond of it. It's my favourite uh, drink. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see behind me, however, this over there, um, because um, we don't want our Beloved United Kingdom to break up, so um, keep a very strong Scottish connection going <laughs> and Scotch whiskey. But there's a little secret attached to this Scotch whiskey. Um, uh, you may even see the portrait of Her Majesty the Queen back 
uh, of course, as well. But um, she is guarding uh, my portrait queen. Uh, this, and you may just be able to see the cat badge on the camera. Um, and since, since Zoom is used uh, potentially by Chinese intelligence, I hope you Chinese people are terrified <laughs> of that. Okay? Um, because we don't want them to, um, uh, to get away with it. Push off this great biological warfare attack. So there we go. Yeah. That, is, that is strategic messaging 101. And well, strack holds. Hey, that's, yeah. plain psycholo that's plain the psychology that we learned about before. And so, yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Kevin and I, to, and we've, we talked about this earlier, but for the rest of the audience, to honor our, our English uh, and our British friends across the honor, we are drinking gunfire tonight, which yeah. is black tea with rum. And I actually didn't have any British rum, but I did get some from Bermuda, which is Pretty darn <laughs> close to British, so I did. <laughs> I do have some Gosling Black Seal, hey. which, is, which is Bermuda rum, which is I think the closest thing you can get to British rum these days in Earl Grey, and it's surprisingly, surprisingly smooth actually as a combination. Oh. So M mine's bloody it's, awful. I, I drank it all down and then just filled it up with rum, so I'm basically drinking Puerto Rican rum at this point. <laughs> So that's yeah, that's the interesting. So there's there's that there's the Spanish Empire connection in, this, in all of this right there. Oh yeah, so. yeah. Well, we kick their ass as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's just true. That whole Peninsula War. That's a whole. Uh, that's a that's an if that's we can talk about that later during the, the book talk. But yeah. it's definitely yeah. part of your long heritage of using proxy forces to avoid putting boots on ground on continents or elsewhere, yeah. which you guys yeah. are pretty darn good about. So. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Straight out of the patent playbook. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> So um, now here's a, here's a follow-up. This is now we're on the, uh, the sixth question now. So if you had unlimited resources and cash, no matter what, what would you be drinking tonight? If all of a sudden you had an unlimited bank account, and it could be what you're drinking now, but if you had unlimited resources, unlimited cash, and there's really no time, fourth dimension goes away, you can go back in time and get something, what would we be drinking tonight? That's a really good question. I mean, the obvious thing sort of is to say something about champagne and, and all that. But actually... I think what I do, we've had a lot of pubs close in Britain um, over the last few years. Um, because, of course, people go to the you know, there's a supermarket and they'll go and buy beer and, and they won't sort of frequent uh, nice places. So I, I would invest my money in Old Speckled Hen and I would use that to open uh, a global chain next to every McDonald's around the world. And then I'd sort of say to people, right, well, you've got a choice. You can either go and get a plastic hamburger from McDonald's, or you can go into this pub and get a very, very fine bottle of old speckled ham. Uh, I think that's probably what I'd do. Um, and then I just tour around the world, you know, explain to people how wonderful, how wonderful this particular English ale really is. I, I like it. That's great. That, that's a, that's a two-pointer right there for this round. <laughs> I, 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 think, I hope I'm scoring points on being sort of slightly uh, rude to my American hosts. No, it's, it's like I said. The answers are made up and the points don't matter. So you are winning no matter what. So um, now the final question of the pregame is yes. uh, if you could drink with any famous person in all of history, who would it be? And I'm going to, I'm going to make a disclaimer on this because obviously Lawrence is about the book subject. So I'm going to say, you can't say T E Lawrence. No, no, uh, I think, I think that would be entirely wrong um, because <laughs> I mean, it would be, it would be a bloody difficult conversation. I'd say, you know, I've written a book about you. He'd say it's all wrong. You've got me completely wrong. Um, and and, uh, also, also, <laughs> yeah. E. Lawrence was a teetotaler, which makes him a horrible first subject for this episode. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, he was. Um, I mean, even you know, Winston Churchill. When I was looking up just this afternoon, what you know, what does what did Winston Churchill think about Lawrence? He said, you know, he was just odd. I mean, he just went in kind of curiously odd. Um, so who 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 drink? That, that's, really um, that's a really good drink. That's a very good question. Um, I guess um, one of the candidates might be um, Ulysses S. Grant and say to him uh, about the Overland campaign to say, is there another way? I mean, can you, can you just do this without killing as many people as you're having to kill? Um, that would be one option. Um, uh, a slightly more a kind of um, interesting kind of conversation, um, but awkward, um, would be perhaps with Adolf Hitler to say, what the hell do you think you're doing, you asshole? <laughs> um, that would be quite a short conversation. Um, I guess, uh, you know, people that, that are particularly interesting and instructive though, about sort of military ideas, and about how you think about armed conflict and, and all those sort of things. You know, there are, there are a couple of candidates. 
it's going to be really hot, tough to, to choose one. Um, but uh, now, the guy we're always trying to figure out, all of us, is Carl von Clausewitz. We, you know, we, we kind of just want to sit down with him and go, I know your wife rewrote the first book, and I know you died before you finished it, but it is blooming complicated, your book. You know, um, I, I think I just want to sit down with him and go, now you're alive again. Can I just, can you just talk me through how you would have finished that book? And then we'll publish it as a revised and abridged edition. And then we'd have all understood it and we'd have stopped arguing for the last 200 years about what Clausewitz actually said and what he really meant. Do you think? What would your choice be? Oh, my choice? <sighs> I mean, this is probably the most quintessential American answer, but uh, probably Washington as an American. Yeah. Just because the intriguing character, the fact that he was the epicenter of not one but two major wars. I mean, he was pretty much one of the catalysts of the Seven Years' War, as we love to call the the lovely French and Indian War here in America. Uh, I know that's a terrible answer, but uh, he's always intrigued me. Uh, he seemed to be a man of principle. Also, he you know, was first president and was pretty much the father of the nation. Uh, but I will pass to the two gentlemen on my left and right on the right. Rob, I got to go with the Foxy Minx, Margaret Thatcher. That's a no-brainer oh. for me. <laughs> well, that's not usual answer. Um, Second, yeah, well, j just ahead of Posh Spice was the other. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, yeah, all right. <laughs> so what, what question would you ask Thatcher? I mean, just out of interest. I mean, I'm curious. Say, say that one more time, Rob. What, what question would you have asked uh, Margaret Thatcher? Would you, you know, what would you want to know? Would you consider dating me? That, that would be question number one, Rob. Oh my goodness me. Right, okay, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, there's a joke in the United Kingdom that, that goes around saying that if you need to kind of take your mind off something, um, you know, okay. <laughs> uh, if you're enjoying yourself, you should take, people say making love to Margaret Thatcher on a rainy day would be <laughs> one of those sort of things that potentially would, you know, would sort of distract you sufficiently. From so that's, you know, that was actually, I really like that one. That was I'm part gonna, of part of that. The greatest, you know, one of the movies that actually is one of the greatest examinations of British culture, Austin Powers. I believe that yes. was a line from that. I, I, indeed it was. Indeed it was. Uh, and, but and remember, I see. Miss, Miss Thatcher, you know, what, she starred in a James Bond movie. She was at the end yes. of For Your Eyes Only. Uh, yes. You know, the parrot and yeah. her had, an, had a different, a nice conversation. I, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that's true. Although I have to disappoint you, that wasn't really her. Um, oh, I'm heartbroken, Rob. I'm heartbroken. <laughs> So, yeah, God, what do you got, a man? Divisive figure. Oh, my... It's a divisive figure in British uh, culture, I have to say. Uh, I'm split between two. Uh, obviously, I'd like to, to drink with Thomas Jefferson for all of his insight. Um, I'd also like to drink with uh, Jim Morrison, the lead singer of The Doors, to yeah. see where my drinking keeps up, um, to see where right. I really <laughs> fall off in the great drinkers of history. <clears throat> You'll last maybe an hour, brother. Maybe an hour. Yeah. You, you probably have to get your. It, too long with that, you'll probably get tested by UA and then come out out of the army the next day with Jim, <laughs> the, the old Lizard King. That would so. be awkward. Uh, so, and if, since you know, we've to give a British answer, I would I would like to drink with the entire uh, Led Zeppelin band uh, oh, once yeah. again. That's Kyle going to test my limits, but also because yeah. they're Led Zeppelin and they are my rock heroes. So yeah, that's that's really good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. No, fantastic. So that that ends the the pregame, and I have to say, you you won. Uh, your, oh, your, thank you very much. Thank your prize was the coin that you already have. So we we somehow use the the powers of CA to get you your your coin that you already have. I, so. I think best finish in the history of KLE. Right? Am I wrong in that, Cheech? Back me up. We lost him again. Yeah, best oh, point total. Okay, thus far. Time later, Mr. Johnson. Um, then let's pivot over to the actual book. Yeah. Oh, this is this is the this is this is current. Um. All right. Definitely losing him. All right. Okay. So uh, we we lost James again. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Right. So uh, so Dr. Johnson, yeah. first question is, what made you write the book in the first place? Okay. Um, what we have so. ever had on key logger engagement? Which I will note as our first. There's something weird going on. I'm getting some really weird kind of. Feedback. Same here, Rob. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Um, so I'm going to carry on. But uh, uh, so what? You know why? Yeah, exactly. I mean, 
weird things about this okay, there are probably about 2,000 books uh, and uh, articles that have been published uh, as biographies of T. E. Lawrence of Arabia, um, which is a bit awkward, you know, if you want to do something interesting about the guy. Um, and I remember, you know, I went to a conference uh, two years ago um, in Kentucky, um, a Society of Military History conference, and I was saying, you know, because I was doing research, I said something about you know, um, James Lawrence. And the guy in the audience, uh, one of the kind of um, an officer who I won't name to protect his innocence, he said, "Yeah, but this is just a kind of film character, right? I mean, why are you writing a book about a movie, fictional movie character?" And I had to explain to him he was real, and this guy was was shocked because um, um, our image of this guy is that um, he's the sort of character from a film in 1962 played by Peter O'Toole, right? Um, and uh, the, real, the real reason I did this, if I'm absolutely honest uh, about, about why I did this, is because all the way through my life, this bloke keeps crossing my path. Um, like everything I've done in my career has been very, very close to the sort of things that this guy has done. Um, and uh, even, even to the extent where, I'll give you an example, right? So when I got a job at Oxford University, I was in terror. The first sort of year or so, I, I thought that people were going to come up to me and go, "Why are you at this university? You're you're not good enough good enough to be here. Why don't you just leave?" You know, I, I was absolutely terrified. But my office was in a building um, in a place called George Street in Oxford. It's a beautiful uh, old building. Um, it's fantastic. It looks really grand uh, from the outside. But it used to be it used to be a grammar school. Um, so that's like kind of a you know what you guys call a public school. Um, and um, much to my surprise, the office that I occupied was the same room that T. E. Lawrence had been educated in when he went to school. Wow! Right? Then, then I went to after All Souls. I, I went to All Souls College, um, you know, to do when I first got to, to Oxford. That had been Lawrence's college in 1919. Then I transferred from All Souls, and I just picked uh, another college to go to, and I went to Pembroke. Uh, in Pembroke College, it's, it's a bit off the beaten track, there's a beautiful church in front of it called St. Aldate's. Where had T. E. Lawrence, I found out, been uh, a young cadet before he uh, left university and joined the army in the First World War, he'd been uh, a cadet at St. Aldate's Parish Church. And so everything I've done in my life, you know, um, even the borders of Pakistan and Afghanistan was where Lawrence turned up, you know, a few years ago, I almost broke my wrist, like he did. I mean, it's just got really uncanny. And I thought to myself, I'm going to have to get this bloke off my case by uh, effectively not writing a biography like everyone else has done, but actually to look at what did he think? What was Lawrence the thinker as a student, as a sort of fighting man? And then after the war, you know, when he's sort of been through it all, you know, he starts to reflect on what he'd been through, were his ideas. That, that's what really fascinated me, because I'm interested in ideas. Um, and so that's where it all came from. Yeah. Horses for fear. Yeah, and also given how, um, what's the word for Lawrence, unique of a personality he was, how tempting was it to try to write another biography? Well, you know, the thing is, you know, when you want to sort of write about the ideas of a military thinker, um, you can't entirely separate, can you? You know, the person from, um, the, the idea is. I mean, imagine, you know, if you became a sort of famous writer, uh, you know, you sort of write uh, some brilliant uh, when uh, I treatise. Yeah, you know, when you do it, when you do it, right? You'll write some brilliant treatise about how to combine cyber warfare and information warfare and civil affairs, let's say, for example. Okay? Um, now, when people come to study you in the future, any of us, uh, would they really, really be able to separate entirely you from those ideas? Because is it something about you, your experiences, that give rise to that particular insight? I think it is, probably. So you can't get away from him entirely, but he is, he is um, an odd character. I mean, he, he's pretty strange in some regards because he's highly educated. Um, he's clearly uh, interested in quite esoteric sort of ideas in his head. You know, he, as, a, as a younger guy, he was sort of... Um, interested in studying medieval knights and his version he what he imagined the medieval knights of the night was chaste right? not going to have any sex um he wouldn't do any drinking uh he used to sort of go out on um, cycle rides and push himself 
um, for hours and hours and hours in physical fitness to make himself lean and as tough and sinewy as he possibly could in emulation of his, his medieval heroes. Um, he was quite interested in, in um, risk taking. So he goes on a walking trip around the Near East. He covers hundreds of miles. Um, he goes unarmed initially and gets robbed and beaten up. Um, subsequently, he goes out with a revolver. Now, I imagine if you said to your tourist agent, you know, I'd quite like to go to Central Africa on holiday. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to take with me a small firearm. I mean, you can imagine you know, this is <laughs> yeah. something that wouldn't go down to everyone. Well. Um, I think the other thing that's really interesting and really striking about it is that he goes in for intense study. Now, I know that the competition has been, over, since this COVID-19 Chinese virus uh, that we've had, um, everyone has done what I've done behind me, which is to sort of make sure your camera is set up with all your books um, behind you. It's like a kind of like um, a showing off exercise of, look how, look how virile I am from a feeding point of view. Um, but I think the weird thing about Lawrence is, you know, he did, he did study intensively. He built, uh, he had a bungalow built from by his parents, his garden, which was full of books. And he would spend hours not conversing with other students or playing games or going up to do rowing and things like that, good ops of people drinking beer. He would instead, really study intensively um, you know, his, uh, his areas of interest, which were time primarily um, either uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, what's today Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, but also military theory, military history, um, works of Marlborough, he'd look at Wellington, he'd look at, you know, the kind of American, uh, well, you'd say revolution, we say war of independence, um, that was <laughs> unpleasantness. Um, and, you know, and he would, he would really try, and he had a method, which I'll, if you really, really want to know, I'll tell you this. What's well, a great, get... it's a great segue, because uh, in the book, you talk about how he really delved into Clausewitz and Jomini and the other preeminent thinkers of the late 19th century. Huh? Um, and we were wondering, how do you, how do you think he really uh, pulled those thinkers into his day-to-day -day operations? And who did he favor more? Um, yeah. And who do you think about, you know, did he read Mahan when he was thinking about yeah. um, transversing the desert? Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's great. You, you've clearly been looking at the book. So, <laughs> um, I mean, what's, there are some really unusual things um, that he picks up on. Um, and you're right, you, you mentioned Alfred Bear Mahan. I mean, a uh, great thing about Mahan's you know, idea about um, uh, sea power is that the problem for naval officers in the 1880s and 1890s is finding your enemy. I mean, there's a vast ocean out there, and you've got to locate your enemy. That's difficult. Um, and a ship, of course, is like a self-contained um, you know, unit. Uh, it's entirely independent, self-supporting, has its own internal resources, its own propulsion unit. Um, and, you know, Lawrence um, you know, made the analogy that being on camels in the desert is a bit like being a ship in the desert. Um, and that your enemy is going to find it very hard to find you. First of all. And if like a ship, like a small rapid ship, you can move around the desert with impunity, you can operate, you can maneuver. And I think that idea, you know, we, we really kind of borrowed the idea of maneuver, how important maneuver is. And there's no doubt that you asked, you know, What's the most influential, most referred to part of this book as a military thinker? Um, well, I can tell you now, he didn't like Clausewitz. Okay? Uh, he thought that he reduced Clausewitz to the idea that at the point of combat, um, you are focusing all your resources at one single point, and it's really a full on frontal, you know, smashing match, which is going to lead to lots of deaths in order to break your enemy's will. And breaking your enemy's will, like the Second World War, it, it requires massive resources, massive amounts of effort to actually make that happen when you're up against a really good adversary. So Lawrence rejects Clausewitz, he rejects uh, Marachal Foch, um, you know, the generalissimo of the First World War, um, who becomes the Allied Supreme Commander, um, because of this emphasis on smashing the enemy. And his favorite authors are those talk about manoeuvre and about indirect methods. So probably the person um, who refers to the most uh, would be Maurice de Saxe. Um, and Maurice de Saxe is a famous French general of the 18th century. 
um, prided himself on being able to maneuver his way around an opponent, cut off his lines of communication, so you didn't actually have to fight battle uh, at all in some cases. And if you did, you'd already maneuvered yourself in such a way that the, the result was a foregone conclusion. Which reminds you of Sun Tzu, isn't it? Sun Tzu, as we say in Chinese, that you only fight a battle when you really know the, the outcome. Um, now, there are others, um, and, and you can talk about um, some of these if you like, but I mean, uh, some are a bit more obscure, um, like Alessarius, uh, say, Gideur, um, and those. But I, I would say that probably the thing he draws out of all the French writers of the 17th, 18th, 19th century is the importance of spirit, okay? Um, you know, spirits. Um, so he, what he, he's really focused on is, um, like, take for example, Ardan du Pic, okay? Ardan du Pic, famous French um, officer of the 1860s, gets killed in battle uh, in um, the Franco Prussian War in 1870. And uh, Ardan du Pic made this famous remark that um, when everyone's telling him that you know, modern warfare is all about new technology, and du Pic said, look, Technology is all one thing, right? And we get really focused on technology and how new it is and what it can do, the novelty of it and its capabilities. He said, look, human nature in war doesn't change, regardless of the technology. Human nature never changes. And therefore, it's not the technology that matters, it's the operator that matters, okay? And it's the spirit, the, the willingness to go forward into hazard and danger uh, which characterizes the very best of all soldiers and marines and airmen and sailors is that the fact that they're prepared to go for it, even when they know the odds. And that's the thing that really appealed to Lawrence, that he could, he could see the value of that. Now, of course, it, it all falls apart. It's confronted by real Arab irregulars because they don't want to go forward into battle and miss mm -hmm. themselves. And they, they, he realized he has to change his theory. As well. well, so that actually, there's two jumping off points there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll ask mine, then Cheech will ask you about the gold. Cheech, that you're going to be talking about. Well, so, uh, is, it's going to be, so his rejection of Clausewitz uh, about the breaking uh -huh. of the center of gravity, uh, it, it comes up time and time again in the book that Lawrence didn't always appreciate the strategic lay of the land in the war. Yeah. Um, so in studying Lawrence as a practitioner, is there a risk of falling into a kind of a tactical trap? <clears throat> yeah, there is, every time. Okay, so um, one, of, one of the problems is um, that when we, whoever we study, like in the past, go, what a brilliant idea. Yeah, I really want that idea. I can use that idea in my military practice. Okay? And you hear a lot, you know, it doesn't matter if it's um, uh, do a an air warfare, or if it's kind of you know people get very excited about paratroopers because you do vert vertical envelopment, um, or it might be something to do with um, you know class of it, and they go oh that, that one line yeah brilliant that's what I want. And of course the trouble is you maybe take it out of context where it belonged in the past. Um, you know it just becomes uh, almost nonsensical and it can be very very risky. And Lawrence was aware of that. You know he his injunction to his greatest fan Basil Little Hart. British military writer, uh, his injunction to the little heart saying, if you believe what I believe, be an advocate of hard brain work. I only reached my conclusions after filtering out lots of detail um, and considering all the options, every factor that were appropriate to what he called the Arabian context. When I realized um, what was relevant, what wasn't, and I filled everything out, then I went, once I really knew my, what I was about. And if I didn't know something, I'd learn it. I'd learn how to operate a machine gun or a tank, or in this case, an armored car, aircraft, um, how to make them all work together. And I'd study it and study it and study it until I got it right. Now, the problem, you're actually right. I mean, you, you didn't spend exactly, you put the nail uh, right on the head there, which is the, um, the tactization. You end up thinking to ourselves that, um, you know, Lawrence, um, you know, somehow won his guerrilla war by hit and run raids, uh, you know, exhausting and attracting his enemy, locking, fixing his enemy in one location, and therefore this is how you do insurgency. And therefore, by by default, you know, what we do as as Western practitioners in the last two decades is we go, all right, that's insurgency. This is how we do counter insurgency. We can we can stop it all here, and we're missing missing the point that. 
you, know, you had to look at Lawrence, like all writers of this period, and indeed any period, critically. Um, so let, let's just do one example, because that's a bit abstract, right? And it's all done to put it into real, real terms. So one of the things he, he noticed was that the, the enemy, the Ottoman army, had a division um, in Medina, uh, one of the two great cities of the Hejaz, Arabia. Uh, Mecca was in the hands of the revolutionaries, which was great, as far as he was concerned. Um, but Medina was held by Ottoman forces. And Lawrence comes up with this expression that he's going to do what Napoleon Bonaparte does at the Battle of Austerlitz, which is going to push out a weak flank. Okay? Uh, he's going to push soldiers out to one flank, and they are going to distract uh, his enemy, the Ottoman commander Fakhri Pasha. And Fakhri Pasha is going to be forced to protect his flank by, and his flank is important because it's basically a, a railway line of communications. He's going to have to fortify uh, this particular um, line of communications. So Lawrence says, look, I extend the flank. My enemy is forced to, to now distribute forces. I've weakened him and I've fixed him. And now I can maneuver and I will go and capture Aqaba and then I'll run on to capture Damascus and it'll be the end of the war, because that's the plan. In a series of steps, he, he said, I, I, I can see war whole now. I can see the whole campaign. The problem is, it's not what happened. Um, I mean, if you look at the Ottoman records, which, which is painful, I can tell you, okay, but the Ottoman records show that they wanted to maintain Medina uh, and the railway line so that they could potentially strike against the British on the southern coast of Arabia, which is Aden. And you can keep that lateral line of communications between Damascus and Medina open, so that if the British army make a move from the Sinai Peninsula up the coast of what is today Israel towards Syria, then of course, as they advance up that northern coast, their flank, their right rear, is going to be exposed to some sort of attack from that lateral line of communication owned by the Ottomans. The Ottomans said, yeah, look, we know there are Arab raids. We know that they are attacking our railways. But we can manage. We'll replace the railways. Uh, we'll replace the rails, rather, and we will protect them with little fortified posts. But this idea of extending the flank, even the official history, the British official history, which you know, we're very sympathetic Lawrence, right? But they said, look, it's very hard to prove that that was the theory of the day. Most people at the time thought they needed to capture Medina, they needed to, to enable British army in Palestine to do the, the heavy lifting. And the Arab forces, and even Lawrence himself in the end admitted as much, the Arab forces were the distraction. They were the deception plan for this main effort by regular conventional forces. So what, what we learned from that, sorry, long, long explanation, I apologize. But what we learned from all that is that this story of Lawrence isn't really a story about guerrilla warfare. It's a story about hybrid warfare combined arms operations and using local forces as this distracting deception component or the main effects of it. So that, that leads me to a, a question that I, I'd like to ask, and that is, so th in, throughout the book, it continually talks about the impact of air power, uh, as well as sea power specifically on, on it and the, the, the predication of that. So would you, would you say that in terms of the Lawrence's goal from a strategic perspective, would you say just the ability for him to maintain the revolt in any situation way possible was actually probably the greatest accomplishment he had due to the political, the cultural differences, as well as logistical issues he had too. That simply maintaining that revolt, would, would that be something you would agree with or? Yeah, no, James, that absolutely hit the nail on the head. I mean, that is his great triumph, um, is that um, although he was very disappointed in his life that he couldn't achieve um, in the war years, on the immediate aftermath of the war, um, kind of instantaneous independence of the Arab peoples in the whole. I mean, the most of them got independence, right? But just some did not. And he was particularly disappointed that the Syrians didn't. But keeping the resistance alive, your absolute right, was the great achievement. Now, after um, the capture of Aqaba, which is, of course, that little notch in the Red Sea, present day Jordan, um, it, it was a critical link. No one had really spotted it until he did. It was a critical link yeah, logistically for the British army in Palestine. So we've got to supply Arab forces, regularize Arab forces, bring in armored cars, bring in air power, bring in shipping, bring in supplies um, and munitions. That really assisted the campaign. And that was, again, you know, not just Lawrence's idea, it was actually the idea um, of his own Arab allies. 
Um, but after they capture Aqaba, there's a period where there's kind of really low air. The, the Ottomans bring in air power, they're sort of interdicting these uh, the irregular forces. The uh, Arab regular army isn't big enough yet to have a big impact. It's barely two battalions when they get Aqaba. So it's quite a small force. So Lawrence is thinking to himself, these guys around me are getting very demoralized. Um, we're not making much progress. And so he basically ramps up um, something which had already been going on from Operation Hedgehog, which are the equivalent of special forces raids on the Ottoman lines of communication, on small outposts, on railway lines, and so on. And that keeps the resistance going because the uh, Arab guys are going, this is amazing. We, we are blowing up, um, you know, we are showing defiance and resistance. We are attacking our Ottoman uh, oppressors as they, as they would have seen it. Um, and it was hugely encouraging. And it word spread like wildfire. Lawrence becomes quite celebrated because he's seen as somebody who really wants the Arab cause to succeed. And he's actually giving them positive successes that they can really you know, get their teeth into and talk about and celebrate. Now, it's not all success. Um, raids fail. Some of the most, the most significant raid um, that was supposed to happen in 1970 um, up in the Jordan Valley uh, was uh, an unmitigated disaster. Um, and Lawrence is in many ways to blame that it went wrong. It, it just put in raids and in ambushes and so on, at the tactical level, things just go wrong. It's friction. Um, but the, the real value was in that ability to motivate and to keep so progressing, even when you know, the chips are down. I think we you know that the art of leadership is to be able to lead people when it's going wrong, not when it's going well. I mean, that's what really matters. Right? So, now I'll follow up to that. So, um, would you think Lawrence would have been able to do what he did without the large amounts of, you know, the royal treasury, the British gold being dropped off and given to the Arab irregulars as a extrinsic motivation? Because, you know, you discussed later on in the book about there was no nation state, like their concept of a nation state wasn't there. Um, so in terms of actual pan-Arabism, a lot of it was, uh, you know, you know, extrinsically motivating through gold plunder. Would he have been able to do that and have the success he had without that huge support of the British Treasury to pay to basically pay for the forces that he was using? That's that's a good question. One of the questions that comes up a lot, isn't it? Um, whenever people talk about it, sort of Lawrence Arabia, was it in the end all about the, what the horsemen of St George? Because all the gold coins have this, you know, the gold sovereigns have this sort of picture of St George slaying a dragon. Um, so, what's it all to do with the horsemen of St George? Um, well, the way, you know, the way we might tackle that is to say, first of all, dealing with uh, a really impoverished society. Okay? So uh, the idea that money is going to come in um, is going to have an impact. I mean, you can't you know, deny that. Lawrence himself tries to play that down and say, no, it's actually our only code was honour. You know, we were driven by a cause. But that's Lawrence talking. That, that's Lawrence's sort of imagination about being a crusader and you know, being a sort of you know, finding a lost cause and, and amplifying it. But the reality was that, you know, money matters uh, for, for local forces. And, you know, if you turn up with a fistful of dollars, then you'll get some cooperation for a while, potentially. Now, the interesting contrast is this, though. This isn't in my book, but, it, but it's worth it. It's something I've written about before in a, in a previous study. Um, what's interesting is that the Germans had agents like Lawrence, like Wilhelm Basmus, Okay, it's operating in southern Persia, today's Iran. And Vasmus had plenty of money, a lot of gold, uh, as did his colleagues like Zugmeier uh, and a few of the other sort of um, German officers who were sort of cutting around the, the country, trying to uh, rouse at one point the Afghans against the British in British India. Um, but they had plenty of money. And what they can't understand is Germans is that every time they give out money, they expect to get loyalty in return of a contract. You know, we paid you money, now you turn up with your weapon, you can fight us. And what was happening is these Iranian guys were going, uh, turning up for the money on day one, and then on day two, just, just, just go back. I've got the money, I'm off. You know, why would I? Why, why fight for the Germans and get yourself killed? I mean, you know, as Lawrence himself said, you know, what's the point in fighting for freedom if you can't taste that freedom okay, as an irregular fighter? If this is someone else's war, why am I going to fight it? You know, the money is okay. So I think what we find is there's some other alchemy that Lawrence had got. And I think what it comes down to is there's something we've learned ourselves over the last two or three decades or so. 
is that wonderful expression by, with, and through. Okay? If you do something with local people in their terms, and if you operate um, you know, through them, that you're not trying to do it all on your own, then you might get somewhere. And Lawrence doesn't do what Wilhelm Wassmann and the Germans do, say, there's your money, do what I tell you. In that very sort of Germanic, German, Germanic sort of fashion. It's very straightforward and logical. It just follows a reason, right? Um, That's so richtig, no, yeah. <laughs> it is, I was clear. Um, but the, uh, Lawrence is sort of much more nuanced. It's about, I've got to persuade someone. I've got to make them think it's their cause. And the money is a kind of an enabler, and it's going to matter to a lot of very poor people. But he uses local leaders, says to, right, this is a key law, so this is, these local leaders, uh, he, he latches on to Faisal, to Emir Faisal, because he knows that Faisal commands a degree of respect, he's got a sort of decorum about it. Um, Faisal doesn't do a lot of fighting, he doesn't need to. Faisal is the symbol of being an independent Arab, Arab man who can represent the Hashemite forces who do so I think this, the alchemy, the secret of all this, as he's concerned, is local people really matter. So in, in terms of the alchemy, and I'm sorry, guys. Um, so this really isn't a new thing for the Brits. I, in, I think that you have a long history of using uh, proxies or hybrid warfare in a sense. I mean, we can look back at the East India Company, which while it was an independent corporation, it was definitely sanctioned by the crown. Um, you can look at the experience that they, the British forces had fighting the um, – the Boers in the Boer, in the Second Boer War, which I think you describe quite regularly, and even going back to Elizabethan times, you can see you know, the, the, the predecessors to the Royal Navy using you know native forces in Central America. So, do you think well, Lawrence drew upon that to be able to help establish this? That you have this long history of British, I mean, Spanish also Peninsular campaign in, in in Spain during the Napoleonic conflict as well. Did Lawrence draw upon those historical? Um, instances to help drive his way of conducting this campaign? Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, there's a paradox about the British in that 300 year period of their sort of imperial history, um, which is um, everything depended upon getting local people brought in to the system, either through honours, you know, you come out sort of like give them some um, particular status, uh, and they, you allow them to fly a, a British flag and you give them a sort of a pension. And, and they become then complicit within the system, right? So there's that. And yet, you know, the irony, the paradox is, um, there's such a strong uh, and unpleasant um, kind of racial prejudice as well within uh, the British imperial system, which, you know, endless, writers endlessly uh, talk about that degree of prejudice. Um, now, the weird thing is, at the very senior elite level, that prejudice is actually quite hard to find. It's weird. Um, and you find, he says, a very great writer called David Canada, a British uh, professor, he's written about this, saying it's, kind of, it's not Orientalism, it's not regarding the other as inferior, it's ornamentalism. It's about, it's about decoration, it's about gifts, medals and hats and you know, baubles and flags. Um, if you create status, um, they sort of seem to, psychologically, people buy into it. And the secret of the British Empire. You've hit the, again the nail on the head about it. You know, the secret of the empire was to get local people involved in running it for themselves for mutual benefit. No one's going to remain in the empire. It's what the Chinese, the Russians don't understand today. No one wants to be in your empire, China. Right, China, are you listening? You don't want to be in your empire. Okay, we hate you if you treat us badly. If you make us partners in the enterprise, like the British did in the nineteenth century, then you become you have a stake in it and you want to make it work. And what went wrong about the American Revolution? Because they lost sight of the importance of bringing local people along with you. And they thought they could just issue instructions and laws from London. And of course, people in the United States, or as it was then still the colonies, would say, but that, that isn't in our interests. And that's the great you know, reminder. So, what does Lawrence know? Lawrence grows up with the imperial thing. Okay? Um, but he's living in a time when there's also quite a strong sense that. The other, you know, local people aren't really up to the job, and they need stiffening by the British and so on. But you might say that in all these military campaigns that Britain fights, um, local forces are central uh, to what's going on. They provide intelligence. They provide humans, as we call it today. They're providing sort of augmentees of mass. 
as auxiliary forces. Um, they're quite often by manoeuvre forces, although the main strike effort is still often done by, by British troops. You find that campaigns from um, Asante in West Africa right way through to New Zealand in the 1860s, you find this exactly this kind of format, this model going on. Lawrence, you're right, is sort of borrowing from the tradition. And I, I did a book a few years ago called, um, well, two years ago, uh, called Truths to Their Souls, which tried to capture these examples of British, French, and American uses of local people how they brought them into the system as a team, how they then maximised that. I mean, sometimes where it went wrong, you know, it didn't always succeed. Sometimes it, it went badly wrong because you know, they just lost sight of what really mattered. Like us. Hey, Rob, uh, hearing you talk about the British approach to colonialism in that day, uh, reminds me of something you got after later on in the book about the French approach to the same thing. Uh, huh? A little bit different. I was wondering how you thought that sort of affected the outcome post uh, World War I. Yeah, well, is it, it is a really interesting contrasting case. Um, the whole French approach to um, you know, uh, their idea of empire and how you operate local people. And as you know, uh, in places like Algeria uh, and Tunisia, um, these were considered to be French uh, territories. These were actually part of metropolitan France. Now, Britain didn't say about bits of India, didn't say, right, India is now the equivalent of Tunbridge Wells or London or Brighton. Manchester, you know, they didn't take that view. Um, weirdly, uh, the French also, with their uh, local forces, insisted that if you were Senegalese or if you were Tunisian, you had to speak French. You know, all the orders were given French. The British army, completely different. They said, look, when we go overseas and we operate with local people, we learn their language and orders are issued in their language. So amongst what became, you know, amongst the Pakistan, uh, amongst the uh, Punjabi uh, soldiers, for example, British soldiers spoke Urdu. Um, if they operated amongst any Afghans, it was Pashto or it was Dari. Uh, if it was in India, it was Hindi or whatever local language they needed. In Nepal, it was Nepali and so on amongst the Gurkhas. And that, it was expected that as a young British officer, you'd do time briefly in training with a British regiment, then you'd go to um, a local regiment and you know, cut your teeth as a young officer and learning how to operate with local culture, learn the cultural norms. Then you can transfer to your actual regiment you would spend the rest of your career in, probably, or at least a substantial part of your career, and there you would learn the local language, dialects, every detail of those people, so that you really, really knew them and they knew you trusted each other. It's a mutual relationship. Um, French in Syria, uh, the moment the war is over and they are awarded a large portion of what is today modern Syria, um, they treat the place as if it's a colony that they own and they can tell people what to do. And not surprisingly, large numbers of Syrians go, well, look, we didn't get rid of the Ottomans just to get another group of imperial leaders. Uh, and there was a big rebellion. The French crush it um, in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, Emir Faisal, who should have been uh, the leader of Syria, is kicked out and ends up in exile in London. And a few years later, Lawrence, uh, the British government, say to Emir uh, Faisal, that we think we've got a better gig for you. We think we know where you can go and be a ruler and be respected and loved. And he's a bit surprised when they announced it's Iraq. So you haven't, I don't do with Iraq. No Hashemites had ever really had a do with Iraq. Um, but the Iraqis are, are extraordinarily tolerant and actually regard uh, ISIL as at least he's an Arab leader and someone therefore we can get to know and, and we can work with. Now, it, it doesn't really work very well. Faisal himself is very suspicious of the British. He doesn't really trust them because he feels sold out over the Syria question. You have to say, you know, what's the bigger picture? The bigger picture is 1919, first war is over. Britain now has an ally for the first time. 28th of June 1919, Britain and France are allies for the first time. And so the British go, can't really irritate our new allies. We've got to work with them. And unfortunately, the French are insist on Syria. So in order to get as much of Arabia independent as we can, we'll have just have to sacrifice that little portion of Arabia called Syria. And that's what we do. And that's where I think some of the rot sets in in terms of why Britain is seen as an unreliable partner. They, they just came up with a, a small compromise, um, but you know, it, it had big consequences. So uh, we'll ask two more questions, and then we'll, we'll break for five minutes before we go to the Q&A from the audience. Uh, my question is, 
and I think Cheech has a question on hybrid warfare in the future. My question is about unconventional warfare uh, in United States doctrine. Um, at the end of your book, you talk about Lawrence's um, relationship with Little Heart. Yeah. Um, Little Heart, be, by the 1960s or wherever, he becomes much more opposed to unconventional warfare, insurgencies, things like that against the Russians. Um, yeah. Where do you fall in that debate on the practicality of La like Lawrence's mindset versus yeah. fomenting insurgencies around the world? <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's a really, yeah, this is a really tricky one, isn't it? Um, and uh, the person that you can refer to here is a historian like Sir John Keegan. Um, and in a lecture um, back in the uh, 1990s. Can we, can we bring him on? Is that uh, yeah, we're famous. Yeah, we're great, isn't it? Yeah, uh, but John Key, I mean, he he um, famously in, in one of the um, uh, yeah, I think it was Reef Lecture or something actually he was giving um, said that he his verdict on World War Two was that one of the big mistakes was to have um, created special operations executive in Britain, OSS in the US, uh, because effectively he said this is this idea of partisan warfare and guerrilla activity in occupied Europe was the prototype of modern terrorism. And so he was, Keegan was saying, look, this is a bad idea. Where did this come from? You know, what was the, why did we go so, so wrong? Now, I mean, it, does it start with Winston Churchill and um, Special Operations Executive? And, you know, this, this, this marvellous book, you know, Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. You know, is it, is it the World War II? You know, or does it go further back? Does it go back to Little Heart and to Lawrence? You know, is this where the rot sets in? Well, of course not. I mean, you know, Max Boot has written a, a vast book on global warfare. It says it's an ancient idea. It just keeps being recycled for each age. Um, Little Heart is sort of midway along this kind of spectrum of thinking about it and about you know, the relative importance of indirect methods, and unconventional methods, and direct and conventional. And Little Heart is a complicated figure, but in the end, I mean, it comes to the view that. You know, states are the most important feature in the world because that's how you stop wars. That's how you get a better peace, as a famous thing called it. You know, if you're going to fight for something, fight for a better peace. The risk of having irregular, regular warfare is always that you just don't know when to stop. It's hard to know how quickly things do an end. And as, uh, as our GATS, uh, you know, wonderful professor at Tel Aviv University, uh, here, I asked him to come to Oxford. Um, last fall and talk about uh, how you end insurgencies and counterinsurgencies. It's, it's very simple, actually, historically. It's very simple. You crush everyone. Um, and you, there was horror, you know, uh, amongst all the academics and my colleagues going, my goodness me, what are you saying? You're saying that massive repression you know, is the only real answer. You say, yeah, well, you know, I'm not saying there are any exceptions. Okay? I'm just saying that the normative historical condition was that degree of repression. And that's why when you see, you know, the Ottoman space by Arab raiders, there's a, there are reprisals, there is crushing, there's an attempt to crush the Syrian nationalists in 1915, they, they wipe out villages in 1917, 1918. Um, and they do the same thing, of course, famously the Armenians. The Armenians are crushed, uh, transported, massacred in some cases, uh, when the attacks can get carried away. Um, what, we, what we derive, I think, from all this is that um, uh, irregular warfare, you know, sa state sanctioned irregular warfare, can say is an act of desperation by states. Why did Winston Churchill argue that we have to set Europe ablaze? Because there was no other way, other than air forces, a striking back at Germany, which dominated the continent of Europe. Britain had no allies at that point, other than the Commonwealth and the Empire, and it, which is substantial, it's a, it's a global one. Um, and you know, Stalin had thrown his lot with Hitler in 1940. Um, and so, uh, you know, all, all he had left, you know, and you know, Churchill was a natural pugilist. He was a strike back. He was constantly telling his generals, you know, get at the enemy. Um, under those conditions, you can see why Britain opted for it. Uh, but, you know, again, we've got to be very realistic about the cost. Sabotage forces, you know, the guys who went out to SOE, large numbers of them. Large numbers were captured, executed in concentration camps. The entire network in the Netherlands 
the early part of the war was wrapped up by the German Abwehr. This is a high risk um, enterprise. Uh, and in an information age, what we should remember is in an information age which we live in today, irregular warfare of that nature is going to be much more difficult because it's so much easier to track, to trace, locate, identify using even the simplest tools. Um, uh, and if you take possession of the state and all its apparatus of surveillance, you're know, running a, an insurgent campaign and those things are extraordinarily difficult to do. Um, and as we know, you know, our own forces have been very successful with very precise intelligence, very rapid intelligence processing, very rapid dissemination, uh, and you know, terrorist groups get rolled up. The moment their, their counterintelligence is very good, they get rolled up. So we may we may be looking uh, today at a period where old fashioned you know, kind of insurgency, uh, old this sort of Lawrence of Arabia style, uh, is, is rapidly running out of steam. So that perfect segue to my last question here um, before the break, and that is, so in a book and, and it's on Lawrence's writing, he said that the urgency wasn't needed, that he felt that they could have done this with civil resistance, a civil strike. So that yeah. kind of leads me to ask, like, is the Gene, the Gene Sharp, the civil resistance, the nonviolent, the Gandhi style, the yeah. actual kind of what Lawrence would have done? Part two, what if he have, and is that kind of the future we go to? And I think we're going to discuss a little bit more uh, future in some of the questions, but that's my question then. Uh, is, is the civil resistance, is the nonviolent resistance, is the strikes, is that what Lawrence ultimately would have done if he had it over? And is that kind of what you see as the state-sponsored version today in terms of stymieing your opponent, using it as deterrence to, to create uh, sub-international level uh, discourse within the nation state to uh, basically impede their freedom of maneuver in the international system. It's it's really uh, it's a really fascinating moment because the reason Lawrence makes this remark about maybe we could have achieved more by some sort of gigantic civil strike, you know, just kind of downing tools, not cooperating with the Ottoman Empire. Maybe we shouldn't have done any fighting at all. It's very appealing to a post First World War generation who lost thousands of lives. You know, Britain is kind of really traumatized. You know the, the way that this, the war between the states and the US you know, has had such a profound impact on the way that Americans think about that period of history. You know, for the British, it's about World War I. That, that has the same kind of impact. And that generation, he was, he was just coming out of the war himself. There's a big strike in Britain in 1926. The whole country literally comes to a standstill. And he's sitting writing his book, reflecting on what he's seeing on the streets around him. The whole country is just kind of grinds into a halt. Because people are dissatisfied. And he kind of gets in his head this idea that maybe, maybe this was another alternative. Maybe I should have fallen on that. And the thing is, of course, Lawrence never puts it into action. He dies you know, in the last of the first, he never really sees an action. But you're right to mention Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi himself tries to do this. And the funny thing is, when you do things like gilets jaunes on the streets of Paris, right? when you do large scale civil disobedience in a liberal democracy, it can work. It can work. If you try that against an authoritarian regime like Russia, China, Tiananmen Square in 1999, and you can see what happens, right? I mean, you're going to get crushed. Um, there was a famous remark made by um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, the, the uh, uh, pastor who posed Hitler uh, in the Second World War. And before he was um, captured and executed for his part in the plot against Hitler's life in 1944, um, he made a, a comment to uh, his wife that you know, resisting a dictatorship is like standing on a snake um, because it, it, its head will come up and, and bite you. Uh, and you know, unless you dislocate the entire snake all at once, like we saw at the end of the Cold War, with this huge civil disobedience, but at every level of society, in every segment of society, in, in say, for example, Eastern Germany, the whole system kind of collapses at once, it's kind of critical failure, then the system doesn't work, it's really hot. Uh, and when the early Indian nationalists took on the British Empire in India, you know, and they tried to um, you know, get the British authorities to sort of see sense, um, the British were very, initially very robust. They were very violent initially against this conflict. And then gradually they realized that this was kind of productive, and then the Indian nationalists know they're on the winner, and they gradually apply more and more civil pressure on the British authorities until eventually it's evident to the British authorities, you just got to go. And after the second war is over, 
by 1946, it's pretty clear which way it's going to go, and the British are out. Yeah. Because 1947, they're gone. Um, and I think there's a um, there's a really interesting balance here. You know, um, these things don't happen instantaneously. It's not as simple as a civil strike. Um, Lawrence is being a little bit naive, uh, and I think only works in certain conditions. And hey, let's face it, all of his ideas uh, only work under certain conditions. Yep. It's very content. Kev, it's all you, brother. <laughs> All right, guys, so we've uh, arrived at the last 10 minutes here of our show. And uh, from here, we're going to, we've sort of deliberated and selected what we think are four of the most interesting questions. Um, we'll kick it off, but the four individuals who have been chosen uh, to ask questions live uh, will be awarded with a new book. So that's kind of cool. Um, but first off, one that we talked about was Meg O'Keefe's question about um, uh, <clears throat> Gertrude. And uh, I, I, I think that's something that we talked about that was really new to us, and uh, we would love for you to ask that question, Meg. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is um, Captain Megan O'Keefe, and there was uh, recently a movie that came out called Queen of the Desert. It articulated the relevancy of Gertrude Bell and her role in helping to establish a lot of the government plans and appointing King Faisal um, to Iraq and her diplomatic efforts uh, really supported British intelligence. Um, but she was totally a loner out there doing a camel train um, with locals. She was not designing insurgencies, um, but she did have a diplomatic footprint. And so I was curious what everyone's thoughts were as it pertains to supporting T.E. Lawrence in his efforts. That's a great question. Uh, that, that's a really good question. So uh, the um, you know movie makers um, movie makers have a really difficult job, right? Uh, because there are probably no more than ten key stories, key types of stories in human history. And uh, the problem for if you make films, um, and I know one guy who, who works for DreamWorks, he was saying really, that you know that you have to you can get a really great story, you kind of got to make it fit with the way that. that you know, stories like that work, right? So the real Gertrude Bell um, is actually much more remarkable than the character that they show in, in a movie, um, in my view. And you're right uh, to um, pick up on the fact that she was more of a diplomat. She certainly wasn't uh, doing the fighting thing. But, you know, um, what Gertrude Bell believed was that you, uh, in Iraq, um, the country had never been united. It was a province, the Ottoman Empire, um, like today, you see the huge um, schismic differences between Shia and Sunni, uh, between urban dwellers in places like Basra um, or Tikrit, compared with sort of those who live in the kind of more remote parts of the countryside or the Euphrates Valley, how different they are from the people of Fiji and so on. And it was, it was this, like that, if not worse, um, the period of the First World War and immediately after. Um, and there are episodes when the British Army had been fighting that region in 1917, where you get local people who are sort of kind of changing sides, um, depending on, on what they think is going to happen next. Now, Gertrude Bell was very intelligent. She realised that um, probably the best chance of making any kind of hope of stability in a new Iraq, a new nation of Iraq, was to um, embrace local leaders who were chefs, um, who would actually... Um, be able to control um, quite, um, uh, uh, should we say, uh, tribal groups who are not used to sort of traditional forms of government that we would be associated with the Western world. And she thought that if I could work through these local leaders, um, then they can create stability. Uh, and to be perfectly honest with you, it doesn't work very well. Um, what they don't show in the movie is that her plan and her hope that this would succeed um, falls to pieces in 1920. And uh, T.E. Lawrence, who she knew from before the war and she knew during the war, um, Lawrence was very critical uh, of the way that, uh, that she and the British authorities um, had tried to win over local tribal leaders and bring them into the kind of British dispensation. Um, and the kind, of, the kind of consequence of all that was that um, the British decide that the best solution uh, is to bring in a king, have a monarch, single centralized form of government, um, try to get, uh, so Gertrude Bell comes back to try and bring the sheikhs back into support, Faisal as a single ruler, 
And Lawrence plays no part in any of that. He's, he's sitting in Oxford for a while, uh, writing. He gets more and more demoralised and depressed about his own life. Belle is actually on the ground. She's trying to make it work. Um, and uh, gradually, she obviously also withdraws from social service. And everything's handed over to the man called Arnold Wilson, this guy who really gets modern Iraq kind of set up in it. It's all that lasts until the 1950s, until Saddam, uh, and before that, the uh, Revolutionary Party took over and effectively ruined Iraq. Iraq was a successful going concern until the late 1950s, and it was effectively ruined by the Revolutionary Command Council, the Ba'ath Party, and they, did, they essentially destroyed what should have been the fabric of the modern state. So, Gertrude Bell, fantastic um, story, much more interesting than the movie makers make it out to be. Uh, and as you say, she was on her own a lot of the time. She was, um, you know, winning people over in what was effectively colonial office was just you know, kind of man's world. And she was the first person to kind of um, break that, uh, that dominance in that way. So a, a really remarkable figure. And I, and I guess if you, know, if you want to write a great biography, what a, what a brilliant subject she is. Thanks, Rob. And uh, again, a fantastic question from Meg. Uh, and we'll move on from here to Phil Walter, who is coming from Divergent Options, also partnering with Unomia Journal and an upcoming writing competition. He's got a fantastic question about the relationship between sort of relative lack of notoriety in the theater, the theater that Lawrence was operating in and his freedom to sort of go his own way uh, because of that. So without further ado, we'll have Phil pick it up from here. Uh, th thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, I've been fortunate in my career to work on things that gained a high level of interest from my headquarters, and I have been absolutely neglected by my headquarters. And I was wondering if Lawrence's efforts, which he himself considered a sideshow of a sideshow, whether or not that um, I may ignorantly view it as so-called neglect from UK headquarters proper, gave him the operational freedom to achieve the success that he did. Thank you. You're absolutely right. I mean, your instincts and your own experience sounds to be uh, absolutely uh, on the money on this one. Um, Lawrence lamented the fact that um, in uh, mid-1917, um, that a, a man came in called Colonel Dornay, uh, Alan Dornay, who was a guardsman and incredibly well organised. I mean, literally down to the last detail, like any good professional military officer, you know, logistics was done properly, Armored cars in the right place, right timetable, aircraft, you know, kind of coordinated operations. And Lawrence described it as the end of the wild man show. Um, because he realized that the way that this campaign would be won would not be with small parties of, of mounted irregulars um, blowing up railways or taking pot shots at isolated Ottoman patrols, which, but was to basically come under command. General Allenby, Edmund Allenby, um, and that uh, Alan B was the guy who basically insisted on coordination and the liaison officer was at Colonel Alan B. Um, now in terms of our own, how do you, how you do it? My own motto is um, no limelight, no limits, right? So <laughs> if there are things where you don't get a torchlight shone on it, um, you can do it. And as Abraham Lincoln famously said, um, you can do what you like in this world as long as you don't mind who gets the credit. Um, and I think there's, there's truth in, in these aphorisms about, you know, um, the way that, for example, special forces operate. Um, the moment the media get a handle on what the, uh, any soft team is doing, that's the end of it. You know, you know it's not going to succeed now because basically it's gone public. Um, and when special forces can do things that are hidden, covert, uh, and then they go in, they do the job, they hazard everything, they come out again, and that's the end of it. Um, you know that mission's got a great chance of success. Um, and that goes for our fantastic intelligence services. Um, we do a fantastic job, and no one ever raises them or celebrates what they achieve, and yet they keep us safe every day of the week, 24 um, 7. Um, so I think, you know, um, I, I would, what I would say is, to help you, Phil, is um, thank you for what you're doing, thank you for what you've done. Um, I'm sorry that people don't recognize you, uh, but maybe in a sort of perverse way, that's probably the greatest accolade you can have. Um, it's, uh, it's about do what you've got to do, do the right thing, and then have the quiet satisfaction amongst you and your comrades that you've done it right, did it for the right reasons. That's what keeps me going. 
<laughs> Thanks, Phil. Thanks for being here and uh, appreciate the really insightful question. Uh, Moving on to Lance Duhlman. Uh, Lance's question relates to Lawrence's interpersonal skills and how he was able to influence uh, some of these people that he was able to influence during his uh, time in the Middle East. So during the Arab Revolt, how was Lawrence able to uh, befriend King Faisal? Uh, what type of cultural skills did he have that gave him confidence to do what he did, which ultimately proved to be strategic during the na in nature during World War I? Yeah, Thanks. that's a great question, Lance. Um, yeah, and it's one that's all on our, our minds right now, isn't it? Because, um, you know, we want to know how to be really effective in these things. I remember I once was in um, NATO Defense College in Rome, uh, Rome, Italy, not the US. Um, and uh, I asked a, a Marine Corps colonel and said to him, well, one thing which you really want to have, if you could have any bit of technology uh, for your operations in the future, what would it be? And he thought about it for a long time. Uh, he's obviously a very educated man. He said, you know what I want? I want to put a little block. My throat here. So every time I speak in my language, it can be heard in the local language and they understand it, even down to the suffixes. So, you know, well, no such box exists, you know. Um, but, you know, what an interesting question, uh, an interesting response. Um, and I think Lawrence's skills um, are sometimes not very well understood. Faisal himself said that uh, when he was asked, you know, uh, what did you think of Lawrence of Arabic? Arabic? language. She said, yeah, she said, Lawrence speaking Arabic, it was always an adventure. So there's something of a kind of colourful turn of phrase that Lawrence would use that local people would think was either quite amusing, uh, that someone would attempt it, or that was sort of somehow resonant with the elaboration that we go in for. So, you know, people in the Western world, very direct, like the way we talk to each other. I've got this theory, the more Germanic you are, the more direct you are, okay? Um, whereas in the Arab world and in large segments of, of the kind of greater Middle East, if you want to call it that, is that the real ability to charm someone with the over is to um, elaborate, to illuminate, uh, and um, to appreciate and empathize much more and spend time uh, talking and listening to what other people are saying. And there were, long, there were long periods, we know from Lawrence's own accounts, his little diaries, that there were long periods of time where in a tent full of people, no one spoke That there were deliberately long pauses in between things. No one would interrupt, no one would try and jump in, uh, as we so often do in, in our Zoom calls with each other. You know, people would, they would listen and they knew the speaker was going to say something. And sometimes almost a minute would go by before the next expression was launched. Lawrence kind of understood that. He knew when to talk and, and when to be silent culturally. He said it on camel rides, it lasted hours. I would spend time listening, um, asking questions about you know, how do people do this? When they, when they sort of fetter their camels, how do they tie the ropes? Which wells do they go to? Why don't they ride on the hilltops? You know, any detail you could pick up, uh, endlessly questioning. That's exhausting. Anyone, if you've done any of this stuff yourself, you'll know. I mean, this is tiring, right? Um, so I, I, you know, he was an incredibly patient man, um, and I think uh, he, I think he genuinely embraced uh, and was interested in Arab culture, um, and, and I think that was a really interesting skill to transfer yourself into another place. Now he always. Felt guilty about his survivors in Costa, I wasn't real, I was artificial, and, and got a guilt trip about it later in his life. But I think there's something to be said for um, rapport, as I should say, reading back um, what your interlocutor was saying to you and appreciating it. Um, so uh, I, I guess that's where his primary skill lay. I hope that answers your question. It's interesting you say that about uh, you know, learning to be silent because uh, one of the ironies of the acronym KLE is that we believe that every engagement is a key leader engagement if I'm involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so true. Yeah. Individualism at its core, my friend. 
Thanks for that note, Kyle. Uh, and again, Lance, thanks for tuning in and thanks for asking a, a wonderful question. Finally, we'll finish up here with the Q&A portion with uh, Matt Radman. Uh, Matt's, uh, question, Matt's, I, yeah, Matt's question I think really resonates with what you described as people using Lawrence's experience as a quote unquote dogmatic blueprint, which I thought was excellent uh, and sort of in instrumentalizing what Lawrence did. Uh, so Matt. Hey everybody, uh, thanks. Thanks very much for putting this on. This is a great talk and experience um, while I'm juggling watching my two kids. Um, <laughs> there, uh, real, the question I had was, um, we've had so many officers that have tried to emulate Lawrence over the years since the war on terror started. And what really takes, what do you think is the key ingredient that Lawrence had that really set him apart that kind of took at all of his teachings and uh, writings to kind of take it from being simple bromides and buzzwords that get applied today to actually being successful on today's battlefields that we're seeing? That's, that's a great, great question. That's, congratulations. Uh, I mean, that is the, that is a really bad question. Um, because uh, what we do in our military careers is we really sort of laws training. We know that training is really important. Um, and that training can be in you know, kind of military skills, it can be flying an aeroplane, it can be driving a ship, it can be weapon skills, whatever. We know that's important. But I think, um, as we've all learned, as you go up through your military career, that the thing that really starts to matter is education, not training. Um, that your training is your, is the skills you have to have. They are the essential bedrock of everything. But um, educating ourselves, as opposed to going to a course, and thinking, well, I did the course and now I'm educating. Um, there's something about Lawrence that's really valuable here for us, which is that he was um, deeply opposed to, um, as you said, you know, to blueprints, to templates, and to, as you said yourself, that buzzwords, right? He, he absolutely hated that. And even the most famous example of this um, would be. Uh, the 27 articles, which got reproduced when we were in Iraq, um, and everyone sort of picked up on that Article 15. You know, better the Arabs do it themselves, um, do it tolerably than we try and do it for them. It's their war. We're not here to try to win it on their behalf. And you know, people cited that endlessly uh, as a sort of dogma uh, to the point where people stopped directing local Iraqi troops who were very inexperienced and frankly needed us to direct them at times. And when I was in Afghanistan, you know, the same kind of conversation was going on. Well, they've got to let the Afghans do it themselves. Well, sometimes the Afghans needed our help and they needed our guidance. And they would have been, they would have welcomed that as long as it's done in the right way, in an empathetic way, where you're respectful, quietly behind the scenes of wording rules. So if you don't mind them saying, I think you as an Afghan general should be saying this next year, helping them along. Um, but because of this phrase, people started getting a bit mad about it. And what was really for me ironic about all this was that. When you read the original, the 27 articles by Lawrence, he has this preamble at the beginning saying, these, this advice I can give you of these 27 points are only applicable to Bedouin in Arabia under these conditions. They aren't applicable to Arabs who live in urban areas. They're not applicable to those who are educated Arabs. Don't try and use this in India. Don't do this in Central Asia. You know, he's been very clear that you've got to make your own mind up and that I can't educate you, you have to educate ourselves. And I think one of the um, greatest things about it, my, when I was researching this book, and there are, there are dozens of things in the books I can tell you about, and it's very easy for an author to get carried away here, but I just want to tell you one. I, I completely fell off my trolley when I read this uh, in, in Lawrence's own hands. Um, and basically what Lawrence said was, uh, when he was reading military history, the history of the Duke of Marlborough fighting in Germany in the uh, 18th century, or was reading about Napoleon's battles in the um, Six Days Campaign you know, at the end of uh, 1814, middle of 1814, before he abdicated, he said, I would read um, a section of what these leaders were doing. And then what I'd do is, I, he, he, Lawrence would get up off his desk and think, and go for a run or go run it, riding or something, you think about what decision he would make next in that circumstance, okay? Then you come back to the book, you look at it and go, okay, let's see what actually happened and test his own idea against that. And I call that 
highly intelligent, self-educational. If we were in every military establishment today, not trying to teach people what happened in World War II, in D-Day, for example, Omaha Beach, you know, but instead to say, right, we land on the beach, you know, 230 of command are now killed and wounded or missing, you're not sure where they are, um, what are you gonna do next? Through that. Now, I know there's a great guy, Bruce Goodmanson, who works at the US Marine Corps University, he does this as a living, I mean, he lives this every day. And I, I don't know where he got it from, where he, maybe he got it from Lawrence, who knows, but I've, I've completely changed my own approach to how I read history, how I approach the book. It's completely transformed my way I do professional military education for my colleagues in the armed forces. Um, it's like a kind of, oh my God, I, I now know what this is about. It's about educating ourselves, like giving ourselves the tools, equipment to educate ourselves. Um, yeah, that's, to me, that's been the greatest insight of reading Lawrence. And in the book, there are half a dozen more of those sort of insights like that. And um, maybe you kind of have the opportunity to have a look at it and make up your own mind about, you know, would that be a good study, today you know, or not? You know, maybe, is that use of air power going to work or would that be actually detrimental? It's just thinking through that really, really makes this writer, uh, this person, worth studying. Oh, and by the way, Rose Caraburi, yeah, absolutely, yeah, see you soon, honey. So, okay. yeah, no, sir, thank you. Rob, Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for taking this, you know, these hour and a half, actually a little bit more, so hour 45, two hours to talk with about your book. And uh, I'm going to pitch the book one more time. So, yes, we gave four <laughs> copies away. But I, I will say right now, if you want to understand the modern contextual issues that help define the, you know, the Sykes-Pico, the proverbial lines in the sand that came out of the, the First World War that now still – you know, influence and impact what we look at now in the Middle East, this book is for you. If you want to understand how special operations, hybrid and guerrilla warfare impact the greater strategic maneuver warfare in great power competition, this book is for you. If you want to understand why T.E. Lawrence said the printing press is the most powerful weapon in the role of information operations, information warfare in the modern context, this book is for you. So I would definitely say in the folks that are came to this this keylogger engagement, this book is for you. And I would highly recommend, if you didn't get a free one, to go to Amazon or go directly to the Osprey Books. Actually, go directly to the Osprey Books because it's probably going to not get a cut to Amazon and buy this book <laughs> because this is our field craft. This is exactly what we want to do. And I would say that, that while it is contextual, a lot of the lessons that talked in the later chapters about the failures of putting T.E. Lawrence's uh, wisdom and the pillars into modern coin and modern uh, hybrid and UW are applicable to all theaters of operation. And it's a very important read for everybody that's in this chat. Uh, I will also say that I want to once again thank the civil I think we lost Cheech again. Um, okay. We want to thank Civil sure. International for sponsoring this great event. Um, sure. Thank you so much for your financial support. Um, and just to close this out, three things. First, um, I once drank at the bar, the beer, the spare, and yeah. and uh, that was on my road to my first threatening Article 15 uh, as a as a cadet. Yeah was I uh, almost arrested. Um, as for the people thinking uh, or talking about I drink wine, uh, it's Chateau's <laughs> up, um, which has a civil information management idea, which is that in Operation Dragoon, the French went up the eastern side of the Rhone River and gave the Americans the western side so that the French could liberate. Yes. That's what the vineyards. So when we liberate France again, <laughs> I don't know where the, the vineyards are. Um, tomorrow morning, key event on Saturday at 0700 hours on Eastern Center Time, we will release our official civil affairs reading list that includes uh, Dr. Rob Johnson's book, Lawrence. Uh, and the Art of War. Um, so keep an eye out for that. It's a great, fantastic PDF. It covers not only just civil affairs, but also each AOR and other 
um, curios that need to be read for your own personal development. Lastly, I think next episode of KLE is June 15th, starring Dr. Nadja Shadlow, oh, yeah. <laughs> author of uh, Art of War and Governance and the 2017 National Security Strategy. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining in. Um, have another drink and uh, see you next month. And hey, Rob, if, uh, if your book sales take a tumble after this, I don't, you know, I, I, we can't be held responsible for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> also, Rob. It'll be my fault, not yours. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rob, uh, also, thank you for invoking the Chinese who keep on making me go upstairs and reset my router. But if you did win a book, <laughs> I, just, I just put the, uh, I just put the uh, journal's email address. Email us, email us your physical address, and we will send it to you. Uh, okay. Dr. Johnson, if there's anything else in closing that you want to add, please do. I just want to say thank you very much to my friends at Osprey, uh, Bloomsbury sort of uh, ownership. Um, thanks to you guys. This has been great fun, thank you for much indeed. Um, and uh, I know it's traditional, but I'm going to say anyway, um, for all of you guys out there who are serving, thank you for your service. Thank you for what you're doing for all of us um, in the Western world. We really, really appreciate it, especially over here in the UK. Thank you very much indeed.